right, well, here we are. Thanks everybody for tuning in. My name is Anna. I'm one of the environmental educators at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, also known as VINS. And with me here today is Troy. And Troy is a barred owl. Now I imagine many of you, if you're from the New England area, or even you down in uh, North Carolina are familiar with barred owls. They're probably our most common species of owl in New England, and they are found all the way uh, down as far south as Georgia and Northern Florida. And interestingly enough, over in the Pacific Northwest, you might see this species. Now they're particularly well suited for our wet uh, forested landscapes, which is why you find them a lot here in New England. We do have a lot of deep, dark, wet forests. Think about a place that has some mixed hardwood trees, a couple of pines with a little river running through it, maybe some vernal pools. Excellent hunting ground for a barred owl. And if you don't see them where you might not see them because he's particularly well camouflaged with the bark of those trees that I just described. They're called barred owls because of the barring or stripes on their chest that you can see. If you don't actually see them, you might hear them. And that's because they have a very characteristic call. The call of the barred owl is sometimes said to sound like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And it's sort of a short staccato barking call. A I've had to learn how to do that because Troy doesn't do it. He's a strong silent type, as we say. But they can be quite noisy, especially at times of year like this. So if you find yourself uh, bored in one evening and want to uh, listen for the barred owls in your woods, you can actually make that noise at them and you might attract some to your vicinity. You might cause them to fly in, check it out, say, who's standing out there and saying, hey, I'm a barred owl and this is my territory. So that's essentially what you're saying when you're making that call. And they, who own the territory of your backyard, will want to come in and see who this intruder is. Now, Troy has lived a long time with us here at Vins. We have a wild bird hospital that's part of our mission. It's avian wildlife rehabilitation. And Troy was actually transferred to us from another rehabilitator back in 2012. At the time, he had been recovering from a car accident. He was not at fault, don't worry. He was hit in the head by a car while he was crossing the road and unfortunately he injured his eye in doing so. So Troy has no vision in his left eye and unfortunately he suffered some head trauma as well from that incident. So he is a little bit calmer than you'd expect a wild owl to be. That makes him a really great education ambassador. Troy travels across Vermont and New Hampshire to schools and libraries teaching people who can't necessarily make it all the way here to Vins themselves so he's quite used to that life uh, that he's been with us for eight years or so uh, now. In addition to the avian wildlife rehabilitation that led Troy here with us, we do a lot of different things here at Vince. One of them is education. And seeing as our nature center is closed for the moment, we have moved all of our education stuff online. So we hope to inspire you guys to uh, seek out some uh, resources for getting uh, out and about in the natural world for learning more about your environment that's right there in your backyard. And uh, any way that we can help you do that, we're excited to partake. Because um, we really are, maybe Troy's not, but I am, looking for feedback as to what it is that you guys would like to learn about so that we can do more of these uh, types of programs. So in that vein, uh, I'm gonna be answering some questions that you guys have as they, as they pop along. Um, like I said, the, the chat moves pretty fast, but I do have uh, my colleague here who's putting some questions up on a screen. So I think one of our questions is, are any species of owls endangered? Oh, very good question. Troy is nowhere near endangered. Troy is Troy, is Troy but even the barred owl, the species that he belongs to, is actually quite common and increasing in population. That comes at the cost, unfortunately, of another species of owl that they live together with in the Pacific Northwest, that would be the spotted owl. If you've heard of the spotted owl, it might be because there was a huge conservation concern with the spotted owl back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the spotted owl requires a very specific habitat, that is old growth forests that are particularly attractive to logging. And so habitat for the spotted owl was in steep decline back then. A lot of those forests have been preserved specifically for the spotted owl, but they remain on the endangered species list 
And one of the reasons why they're not actually recovering is because of the barred owl. Not Troy specifically. Troy doesn't know anything about the Pacific Northwest. But barred owls can use that same habitat that spotted owls do, and they're a little bit more aggressive. So they actually will outcompete spotted owls for nest sites, for prey, and um, they do hybridize on occasion. So the spotted owl is an endangered species of owl that's right here in North America. Now there are several other endangered owl species around the world. I can't list them off the top of my head to be perfectly honest, but there's a research project for you uh, if you're looking for something to do. How many endangered owl species are there worldwide? Very good question. All right, what's my next one? What is the most common food that raptors eat? Ah, that's a very good question. I, I struggle to think of something that is common across all raptor species. So raptors are a very diverse group of birds, from owls like Troy here. We also have the falcons, which mostly hunt other birds. The peregrine falcon, for example, subsists on uh, city pigeons and starlings and the like. Owls are kind of generalist predators, so they'll go after mice, lizards, snakes, the barred owl is known for eating crayfish, frogs, and salamanders. Hawks, like the big red-tailed hawk you might be familiar with, they're mostly mammal hunting predators. So they're going after squirrels and chipmunks and something as big as a cottontail rabbit. Then you have a bird like the osprey that is uh, almost exclusively hunting fish, and they count as a raptor. And then you have something as tiny as the American kestrel. A small falcon weighs about 100 grams or four ounces. Those birds will eat uh, a majority of their diet, the insects in the summertime, things like grasshoppers and dragonflies and caterpillars. So quite a variety of things. The most common food that raptors eat depends on where they are and what they are. So good questions. All right, how much does he weigh? Kristen and Quinn are asking, how much does he weigh? Troy weighs about 800 grams, which is roughly a pound and a half or so. We do weigh our birds every day at Vince, and that includes while we're close to the public, we're coming in and taking care of these birds. So I weighed him this morning, he weighs 800 grams, uh, and it's surprising how, how light that is given his size, but really a lot of this bird is feather. If I were to poke Troy, which I'm not going to do because that would be very rude, uh, my finger would disappear up to the second knuckle in feathers before I actually hit the side of his head. So a greater majority of what you're seeing right now is actually feathers and the weight of his body comes from his skull, so his, his eyes and his brain, uh, and the, his sort of torso where all of his muscles for flight are, um, and anything that he's eaten recently actually has a huge effect on how much he weighs. <laughs> Maybe like the rest of us, I don't know. All right, how tall is he? How tall is he? He's about this tall. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I don't, um, I've never measured. <laughs> That's a great question, Aaron. I've never measured how tall Troy is. From my glove to his head, I'm gonna estimate he is about a foot tall. And he's got another six inches of tail behind that that's hanging out on the back side of my glove. He's maybe he's a foot and a half tall, maybe tall. I don't know. Ooh, when is owl breeding season? Right now, actually. Right now is owl breeding season because they get started really, really early. A lot of people don't know this, but most owls don't build their own nests. They either use a tree cavity like Troy would do, barred owls will nest in a hole in a tree, as will screech owls and northern solid owls, or like a great horned owl, they'll actually take a nest from another bird, from a crow or a raven or a red-tailed hawk. They will come in in January or February and set up camp. Ooh. Troy has decided that he is done <laughs> with the live stream. We'll try and take a step back and see if he gets a little bit calmer about that. No, uh, in January, February, gray horned owl family comes in, sets up camp in a raven's nest that a raven built last year. And then the raven family comes back and says, okay, I'm not gonna try and evict these squatters that, that will hurt. So I'm gonna go and build another nest. And that's kind of how the cycle perpetuates itself. Owls use other birds' nests. And so the breeding season is very early because they have to get in before those other birds do and reclaim their old nests. 
So uh, gray horned owls have babies in the nest right now. Uh, barred owls probably as well. In the next month or so, our avian wildlife hospital should expect to see some nestlings. We do every year see a couple of uh, nestling owls that fell out of their nest and need their, either they need medical care or they need to be replaced back into that nest, um, which is something that we have done in the past with some great horned owls and a barred owl, is just put them right back in the nest with their family because that's, if they're uninjured, the place where they really should be. All right. How old is Troy? Very good question, because we actually don't know the answer to that. Troy has been with us since 2012, so he's at least eight. We've had him with us for eight years, but he was injured as an adult, so we don't actually know. He could be 28, and we have another owl named Milton who retired from our education program several years ago, who is 28 this year. She's still going. She was retired when she was 22, and six years later, she's still enjoying, enjoying life. Um, so Troy could be quite old. However, I will say it's probably pretty likely that Troy is eight or nine or 10 uh, in that range because it is often the youngest birds that get in the most trouble and find themselves in places like hunting by a roadside at night when a car is coming uh, and get themselves injured just because they don't really know what they're doing uh, yet. Good questions. All right. Will you confuse them if you call during breeding season? Very good question, yes. Uh, and it is, uh, there is some ethics to think about when you're calling owls. If you're going out in your woods at night and making that who cooks for you call in the hopes of finding an owl, um, it is momentarily confusing for them, of course, because they're not used to hearing another owl in their territory. But so long as you don't go out and do it incessantly every night, they should get over it. Essentially, remember what you're saying to them is, hey, I'm a barred owl and this is my home. And if they think to themselves, okay, well, I thought it was my home and you then go away and are never heard from again, they're gonna be like, well, that was weird. Uh, I'm just gonna keep living here. But if you go out again and again and again and you try and call owls every night for a week, they're gonna think to themselves, uh, okay, this, this guy has claimed this territory for himself, him or herself, and I'll move on. And then you will ha not have any more barred owls in your woods because you have claimed it as your own. <laughs> All right. Wow, we got a lot of questions coming in. Can owls be gentle? Olivia, that is a very interesting question. I don't know that I've ever been asked a question like that. Um, Troy is a little bit chewing on my glove right now. So I will say, while an owl can choose to be gentle, they can also choose to not be gentle. Uh, and whether or not they're gentle is more a factor of what, what is going on in their life. If, he, uh, if Troy is picking up a, a mouse that's alive and he wants to eat it, he's not going to handle that mouse very gently. If the mouse is in my hand and I'm handing it to him uh, up to his beak, and he's really hungry and he wants that mouse, he's not gonna be very gentle with me either. But right now, Troy's sitting on my glove, he's just sitting on my hand as if it was a tree branch, as if uh, he's just hanging out in a, a weird echoey woods room as he is right now. And so he is not clenching his talons around my fingers or anything to that effect. He's merely just sitting on me. And seeing as he's spun himself around a little bit, I'm actually going to uh, undo some of his equipment so he doesn't get all twisted in himself. What are you doing to me? My goodness. Do they live in groups? KB is asking, do they live in groups? They don't really. Um, is it a, a thing we get asked about a lot? Because we do have several birds in our enclosures of fins that live together. We have a pair of ravens, a pair of red-tailed hawks, a pair of golden eagles and the like. Um, these birds live together and they tolerate each other for most of the year. During the breeding season, these birds are somewhat uh, nice to each other, attracted to each other. They'll hang out closer on a branch. They will work on building a nest together and that sort of thing. Uh, but throughout the rest of the year, they tend to just be like, you eat your half of the food and I'll eat my half of the food. They're not social creatures, not like we are, not like dogs are. 
not like parrots are. Owls are solitary and for most of their lives that's the way they prefer it because it means that they get to have all the food in their territory. It's, it's a way to be. They're always social distancing is what I'm trying to say here. Okay, uh, why is his face indented, Amanda? Oh, very good question. You have noticed that Troy has a rather flat face and brilliant little eyebrows there, right? So this is a feature of most owls, not all owls, but most owls have a very prominent facial disc. That's what it's called, that really uh, big concave lines around Troy's face. And what those do, what their function is, it's the same as our ears, actually. So if you look at your ear or your friend's ear across the room, you'll notice, hey buddy, you'll notice that you've got this kind of concave shape to it. It's made out of skin and cartilage. And when you're having trouble hearing someone, your reflex might be to cup your hand behind your ear, making that part of your ear a little bit larger. Troy's facial disc captures sound in the same way that your cupped hand does behind your ear. Only that very large indent is built into the structure of his face. So he is constantly able to hear things very, very minutely, very, very finely, because he has this large surface area for sound. Okay, we're gonna back up again because apparently the iPad is a little bit scary. That's okay. I too find iPads a little bit scary. Um, what do I do if I find an injured owl? I'm so glad you asked that question because we, we deal with that a lot. People, uh, members of the public like yourselves, bring us injured birds. And often times people hear that and go, oh great, but how do I get the injured bird? Especially if it's an owl. These are powerful creatures and his talons, I'll see if he'll let me show you his talons, are nothing to sneeze at. I wear this thick leather glove to protect my skin from Troy's talons, which just are naturally very sharp and very strong. So the thing that we recommend when someone finds an injured owl is if you, you see the owl, you notice that it has an injury, or you notice that something is very wrong. It allows you to approach it closely and it doesn't fly away. That's very wrong. Uh, give us a call. Vince's hotline is open so long as we're open. Give us a call and talk to a wildlife rehabilitator and they will be able to advise you more particularly for your exact situation. In general, what we uh, have people do is if the owl is injured and needs to be brought into our rehab clinic for care, I recommend that you have a towel. If uh, you have a big pair of gloves, that's also great, but a towel and a cardboard box is really all that you need. You would approach the owl with the towel easy rhyme to remember, and plop the towel completely over the owl's body. Just cover it all the way. And then what you want to do is scoop up the owl in the towel, see where the rhyming part comes in, and plop the whole bundle gently into a cardboard box. And then close the box. You wouldn't believe how important this one aspect is, but close the box. Don't worry, Troy, we're not talking about you. And then bring us the bird in the towel in the box. We will worry about extricating the bird from the towel. Um, oftentimes they'll have grabbed onto it with their talons and that's kind of a comfort thing. It makes them feel a little bit more in control of the situation if they're just grabbing onto that towel. But number one, we worry about your safety. And so having that barrier between you and the bird. And number two, we worry about the bird's safety. And that involves keeping it not so stressed out, not holding on to it with your bare hands, taking a picture of it, just get it as quickly as possible into a nice, dark, quiet space. It'll have the best chance for recovery. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, how many raptor species are there in New Hampshire? Oh, good question. This is Stump the Educator right here. How many species of raptors are there in New Hampshire? There are four, Budeo hawks and three occipiters, so what's that? Seven hawks. Regularly occurring three falcons. Um, the osprey, so what are we up to? Not eight. No, 11. <laughs> uh, and then owls, you got me. There's a lot of owls. 
I believe there are nine species of owls that occur regularly in Vermont, and I imagine New Hampshire experiences the same number. So if we add 11 to nine, we get 20. 20 species of rat. Oh, pfft, bald eagles. Throw them in there. 21. Nice. 21. That's my answer. Feel free to prove me wrong. <laughs> what is this wingspan? Oh, very good question. Owls have a pretty short wingspan for how big they are as animals. Uh, his wingspan is probably about three and a half feet. Um, still, you know, very decent wingspan. The reason he doesn't need a super long wingspan is because owls don't fly long distances in high wind situations. He is going to, for the most part, be flying short distances at night in a forest where it's really calm and cool. So he doesn't need the long wings to be able to generate a ton of lift in long distance flights. Oh, buddy, we're going to be wrapping this up in a couple of minutes. I'm sorry. He doesn't need to be able to make uh, quick, tight turns either um, with his uh, wings, which would be another feature of having long wings. So the three and a half foot wingspan really does him good with quick bursts of energy. All right. You okay now? He did start gular fluttering there for a moment. You might have noticed he held his mouth open a little bit and this little throat pouch right underneath his chin started fluttering in and out. That is an indicator that he is hot, which is kind of amazing to us because like only 65 in this room, but using those wings is quite a workout for him. Um, so I am actually going to sneak him back in his crate because that is definitely where he would rather be right now. And I'm happy to answer a couple of more questions when I come back. So give me one second. What do we have? Hmm. Are they related to Velociraptor? Oh, that's a good one. Are they related to Velociraptor? Ah, kind of in a roundabout way. Um, the, there's actually been some new thinking on, on this, on how uh, birds and dinosaurs are related to one another, and particularly on the subject of raptors. And the thinking is that the core group of birds that live on land, that we know and love today across the world, they probably had a dinosaur ancestor that was a lot like Velociraptor. If it wasn't exactly Velociraptor, it's a lot like Velociraptor in that it was a carnivore, it was a, a predator, it probably had very, very sharp talons and very, very good vision and that kind of thing. And the thinking is that as new species of birds evolved through the dozens of millions of years, Several bird species actually lost those traits, including all of our perching songbirds. So the cardinal and the chickadee and the uh, raven and the blue jay, they all lost their carnivory. But the raptors, the hawks, the falcons, the owls, the eagles, the osprey, they preserved it. So they perhaps, if are, they're not closely or any more closely related to velociraptor than uh, any other bird is, they more resemble their ancient ancestors than uh, we previously thought, is, is the current hypothesis. Great stuff. How can you tell a female from a male? You can't. <laughs> um, it's very difficult. In barred owls, there is no plumage difference. They don't look different. Boys and girls are the same. Uh, all of their parts that would make them different from one another, their internal organs, they're internal. So it would take pretty invasive surgery for us to figure it out. So I was calling Troy a boy throughout all of this, but to be perfectly honest, we don't actually know whether or not Troy is a boy or a girl. We kind of just assigned him that, that gender. Uh, we wouldn't treat him differently any other way. Uh, and uh, really the only difference in raptors as a group is size. In owls, there's a lot of overlap, but in hawks and falcons, the females are quite a bit larger than the males. All right, well, I think on that note, we're gonna wrap up this live stream. This was really exciting. On a personal note, it's been a rough time and we, as the educators here at VINS, have been dying to do some environmental education with people. We feel isolated <laughs> in a sense, uh, in the way some of you may be. 
Uh, so we really, really want to continue this, and we want to make sure that um, we hear from you guys. I know that we didn't get to all the questions today, but please join us on the next live stream. That's going to be happening on Friday. We're going to be meeting a reptile next. And if, if that's not as appealing as an owl, you better join us for the live stream because I'm going to change your mind. Um, thank you all so much. Please keep us in mind. We're thinking about all of you. And thank you. Have a great rest of your day.